Next thing is we will go to uh, short session legislative agenda discussion. I recognize Ms. Boyu. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. A pleasure to be with you and uh, to segue into our legislative agenda for the short session. It is a pleasure to be with you to discuss such lofty, important issues. So since the last time we met, we have now aligned both the State Board's budget requests and our legislative agenda, because obviously, as you well know, our budget requests drive much of what our legislative agenda will be. And uh, to start that off, there are really two documents for your uh, attention. One, you see the draft legislative agenda, and you have actually a sort of yellow colored uh, piece of paper. I see some of you scrutinizing it right now. That's wonderful if you're a hard copy person. And then, of course, it's on the e board. Uh, the other document, this is more by way of reference. You have extra yellow copies. We do have some right over here and to your left. And there are accessible copies for the public on the table to the right. So uh, this is a draft agenda, much of which looks very familiar to you as we have been deliberating over these line items for months now. So thankfully, with the input of our chair and our vice chair and others on our state board, uh, in addition to our state superintendent, many of these items look very familiar. So to walk us through it, and I do encourage you to interrupt with any questions or comments because the end game here is for us to have the, for us as the state board, to have its blessing on the agenda for the short session. And, uh, and two, by way of background, we have looked at other groups legislative agendas for this short session, whether it be the teachers groups or the school superintendents groups, school boards association, so on and so forth. So we're very much aligned with what everyone in public education is asking for in this short session. I'm hearing predictions along the lines of a six week short session that I heard just this week. Uh, and then that's a house prediction, by the way, and the Senate prediction is much longer. Uh, so, so we'll see how long the short session will be. Predictions at this point are, of course, entirely premature, uh, and I think a waste of time. But in any event, let's use our time wisely and dig into our draft agenda. Much of our discussion between yesterday and today has been about professional development what is number one in our action items. So we all know the importance of investing in our workforce, and thankfully our state board in its budget requests has embedded professional development in a number of what I'll call big buckets, whether it is uh, in recruitment and retention or whether it is in digital learning or whether it is in uh, interpreting student growth scores, so on and so forth. So. Uh, the professional development ask in the way of numbers, at minimum, when you look at all the little line items, is around a $22 million figure. The big chunks of that are, number one, to reinstate what had been a recurring line item in the form of $12 million to go to the LEAs so that LEAs have discretion on where their teachers or where their principals, assistant principals, administrators need to go for intensive training. And of course we would be, we are advancing a tried and true tested form of professional development uh, in this bucket. So you see the other smaller ticket items in Distinguished Leadership and Practice. That is a program at a $600,000 mark run through the Principals Assistant Principals Association, very well respected. And then of course part of our turning around low achievement schools uh, ask is that intensive coaching that you've heard a lot about between yesterday and today. It's not a sit and get format at a workshop, out of town necessarily. It is provide me the coaching and training that I need boots on the ground to transform my teaching practices today and tomorrow and beyond. 
All right, any questions about the professional development piece? Uh, it also includes a 4.4 million ask uh, that you'll see on the line item budget requests one pager that deals with year-round year -round calendar of professional development provided through DPI and the experts that we have at the state level on really whatever the regions and the districts are needing at the local level. Yes, uh, Dr. Atkins. Uh, this is June Atkinson. You heard Dr. Bracey talk about the effective professional development being received from the New Schools Breakthrough Initiative. And I just want to bring this to your attention. Uh, that, in part, that is funded through uh, Innovation Grant, which has a sunset of time. So as we look forward to the future, we will see that the need for professional development will even become more acute because we will not have the benefit of that federal grant uh, in order to, uh, for some school districts to continue with the professional development that, they're, that they now have. So I just wanted to see to re-emphasize how important it is that we have, that local school districts have dollars for professional development. Uh, Ms. Wellamy. That's it. I had that on my list to mention later this afternoon when we have our open discussion. Right. Yeah. Um, but I think that <coughs> since Dr. Atkinson raised the um, new schools breakthrough and what it's called, breakthrough learning, you know, that's, that's something we learned today that at least Dr. Bracey thought was incredibly important and good and high quality. And he seemed certain he was going to get an ROI on that, Mr. Alcorn, correct? He did. I mean, you asked the question, and I don't think he could give you that data that he felt pretty confident about it. So, you know, as we ask for money for professional development, I think it's really important to embrace my colleagues' conversations about effective professional development and knowing what works and really emphasizing that and you know I think in the past sometimes PD has gotten a bad rap because maybe it is <coughs> drive by maybe it is that once you described you do it 24 hours today and you know it's not quite as effective so I, I hope that as we couch this in our request we can talk about what we're doing in our strategic plan to make sure it's effective. Yes. Ms. Uh, Triplett? Yeah, Triplett. Um, educator effectiveness is near and dear to my heart, but I think effective um, PD starts with the administration. And we have to provide mentorship and that effective professional development for our leaders of our schools so that they in turn can go to those classroom teachers and say, hey, have you thought about this type of professional development? I think that it could further your practice. And I think that's a key part and strategic that we make sure that that happens because that's the key to the success of it, I think. Okay. Very good. Okay. Next. Oh. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Just trying to get some context to this conversation. Uh, are we trying to help guide what we're going to be asking the General Assembly to uh, appropriate, I guess really is one question, and do we have non-appropriation requests as well, policy uh, type uh, uh, issues as well? It's, uh, and I'm saying that because in the context that we're in, uh, we, uh, the governor announced yesterday his teacher pay and scholarship recommendations. Uh, I'm assuming availability is somewhere out there. Somebody's talking about availability, and Philip, I'm hoping that you're someone's in those conversations. Uh, are we? Is the context of this discussion the next three years, or just the short session? Because I think what I'm hearing is the prioritizing of these, and this is a really good conversation to have, but if it's about the short session, this could be a short conversation. But, uh, because 
the availability of, I mean, we talk about the $1.2 billion to do all these, which I think is what it is, uh, uh, but I don't think there's that much of that. Uh, okay, so I, if I can comment, we've, we've already signed off the budget uh, that we proposed, and it's forward look. Is that this one? That yeah, yeah, today? yeah. Okay. And, and, and we've already been in discussion with the budget office. We hope we will have more discussion with the budget office, but we haven't been invited back yet. Uh, the, uh, this is a grant, and this, this is what we're dealing with. Uh, what, what, I, Mr. McGinnis, what we want to accomplish here is that the board is comfortable with our agenda here as far as legislation, other than budget, but it fits back to the budget. Did I describe that correctly? Yes, sir. And we are going to have the privilege of hearing from uh, uh, Ms. Truitt about uh, what the governor released yesterday. Uh, so as soon as we get through this, we'll move to that. Okay. So again, in terms of this, we're recommending intensive coaching for DNF schools. And then we're going to recommend that we change the D school process in a different place, right? Yes, sir. And, and then we're also going to do it in a third place for mid yeah. schools given DNF. So that conversation is in three places here, okay? Yeah. Yes. Because, and I think it needs to be. <laughs> right. Uh, so, Mr. McDevitt, to answer your first two questions, yes and yes. And what I mean by that is this agenda incorporates both our budget, our state board's on the record budget request for the short session and also includes non-budgetary items. For example, this the, or this? the legislative agenda, you're holding in your right hand okay. and the line item spreadsheet on your, in your left hand is what the state board is already on record as requesting officially of OSBM. So that's so the the 231 million. Right. So, you know, our prior document that the board had been looking at in the way of six or seven pages, at least for purposes of legislators, I need to condense it and let them see the snapshot of what each line item ask is budgetarily. So you'll see the alignment between the budget line items and then where it's woven into our legislative agenda. Now, are we going to accomplish everything on this legislative agenda? That's your job. I certainly hope so. <laughs> <laughs> However, you know, it's a, it's a short-term plan and a long-term plan to boost teacher salaries to number one in the Southeast. Uh, you know, that will take time, I anticipate. And the revenue numbers that we're hearing of late could involve as much as $250 million in available revenue and, uh, you know, to boost our teacher salaries to number one in the Southeast is a $529 million price tag in one year. So what's, that what's the number? For to yeah. boost average to uh, what if it's for every one percent I believe it's hundred and thirty seven million dollars. For teachers or teachers and state employees. Teachers and state employees, is that that yeah. So for just teachers it's roughly fifty million for every one percent salary increase across the board. Yeah. That's good information. That's not what yeah, I was asking. It's it's on here. Yeah, I was asking though what is the ad if, to get to number one in the southeast average what is the number the dollar amount yes 529 million dollars no, to get to number one what's the average uh, salary per teacher what's the average uh, i say uh hey the fence purchase or question so what is it again uh, what's the average currently what's the, what's the average salary uh if we get to number one in southeast i wish i could always give a simple answer the best answer is what we put in here, which is the highlights, which you all will be getting a copy of, which is 47792 That's the if, current average salary for, for North Carolina teacher now. If you're asking what is the state average salary, it's closer to 44000 I'm asking what number one in the Southeast is. That's what this document, this buff oh. document says we're going to be number one in the Southeast. Or that's what we're going to chase. Okay. What is that? I'll tell you. We'll get that to you. 
So we'll move on in this discussion about teacher leaders and teacher pay. It's number one. Uh, it is. And thankfully, our state board has been bold in advocating for number one in the Southeast. And, uh, and also, you see the other line items, instituting masters and doctoral pay targeted, that is. And then thankfully with the governor's announcement yesterday, and we will have Captain Truitt come and talk more about the details of that plan that we heard yesterday insofar as a recruitment and retention plan, scholarship plan, so on and so forth. So teacher leaders, teacher pay, obviously a big priority. Moving on, another big ticket item is the assistant principal and principal pay. And I know Dr. Shotwell and others, our advisors, are fully aware of where we are as a state in terms of that administrator pay and the importance of having that principal and assistant principal leader in the building. Uh, there are a host of inequities, and we do know that the principals, assistant principals, and uh, related associations are making this ticket item a big priority here in the short session. Just as a matter of context, since you've given us the figure on to get to that number one in the southeast, the cost is $529 million. And just as a, a matter of context in the state budget, because all of us aren't familiar with that every dollar, but um, if a one cent ta sales tax generates how much money? I think Philip knows the answer to that probably. How much money does a one cent sales tax generate? It's, uh, you know, about. it's between 1.4 and 1.5 billion. Okay, and does that include the new sales tax? Yes, ma'am. Additions, okay. Thank you. Moving on. Uh, so we're on to number four now, and the textbooks and digital resources. That has been a line item that we have consistently been asking for to get us back to pre-recession per student funding. Thankfully, both the General Assembly last year got us into a significant range of getting back to that per student funding level of $29, uh, pardon me, $77.16 per student. And we understand that the governor's budget also will propose a significant move toward additional digital resources uh, funding for that. The digital learning line item, of course, the General Assembly has set the goal for us, which we embrace. 2017, uh, the goal for digital learning in the state. And so we have a classroom technology need to the tune of 25 million, and then our home base funding so that it is free to LEAs at six million. The virtual public school, one of our gems in public education, and the needs there we have asked for consistently an exemption from the Umstead Act so that we can have the virtual public school generate revenue in, in uh, alignment with the 2011 session law that was passed directing the virtual public school to generate revenue wherever possible. So moving on to the back of the legislative agenda and the instructional supplies reinstating that per student funding level to $59.33, and you see the differential of where it has been of late at $28. This instructional supplies request is to the tune of $46.9 million, as you can see in your line item spreadsheet. We'll be asking for that recurring? Recurring, yes, sir. Uh, turning around low performing schools, as I have traveled the state and gotten input from superintendents and other school leaders. This is a hot topic in light of the state law change to what a low performing school is. And so uh, I do anticipate a lot of discussion and a lot of ideas on not only the funding for turning around low performing schools, so our ask on this is 8.6 million and that is just to serve the lowest 5% of schools and the lowest 10% of districts. I get the question often, from legislators and others, 
okay, Rachel, with the 581 low performing schools, what is the funding request for our district and school turnaround model? And that is upwards of 31 million. So just to have a level of context of what we're asking for here versus what that uh, district and school turnaround work would cost if we were to do it for all 581 low performance schools. And going back to Mr. McDevitt, your comment on here removing D schools that meet growth from that definition. Uh, the superintendents across the board are, are scrutinizing what that state law definition is and a common element among other elements is to remove the D schools that meet growth out of that state law definition. And it of course leads into what we would need in the way of the APRF school performance grades line item on number nine. So it's all interwoven here, but for the 16-17 school year, we would have to maintain the 15-point scale, which is a 15-point scale that has been put in place year after year uh, so that for the 16-17 school year, we're comparing apples to apples, if you will. If we go from a 15-point scale where we are now to a 10-point scale, we'll be apples to oranges or apples to broccoli. All right, school calendar flexibility, important to us all. We have been asking for this flexibility for many years. And the House, fortunately, is a big proponent of school calendar flexibility. We have seen it in a host of local bills, and, uh, for, and we will see it on other companion legislative agendas by other groups, of course. So in this, um, in this ask, simply allowing the alignment of, say, the Rockingham County Schools and Dr. Shotwell's system, that calendar with your companion community college, so at least allowing that alignment and flexibility so that students can seamlessly go from uh, one school system into another or attend those community college courses, et cetera. All right, uh, next. Yes. Uh, Mr. Alcorn, thank you. Help me understand the resistance to the school calendar flexibility. I mean, since I've been on this board here every month, it seems, that is, it is being requested, and if I look at it from a common sense standpoint, it just looks like a good idea in a state that's 500 plus miles long. So certainly, no disagreement in this room. Nope. Okay, who can uh, you talk to? I mean, what's? It has been a. Uh, it has been. Is it tourism? Challenging on the Senate yeah. side. Tourism and what's the other one? There were two. Camps. Uh, camps and right, summer camps. Camp, camps. So any Challenge of the summer uh, businesses, right. and there had been a strong lobbying effort years ago when this, when the current school calendar law was debated, such that the General Assembly put in concrete that school must start the Monday closest to August 26th and end the Friday closest to June 11th. And that, that um, change to the law when it happened was hard fought for. So there are folks in the General Assembly who remember those days of having to hear nothing but mm -hmm. those same messages over and over. And they simply don't want to go back to the fervor and hard fought negotiations. Well, but part of that, Mr. Me, the, the people, that, the same people aren't in the building at the time right. that were there then. They, they right. continue to right. to do their lobbying and advocacy. 2016. And, but it was a bad idea then, and it's a bad idea now. But they had partners that should not have been partners in changing that bill, in changing that law. And there were things that happened during that time that should not have happened uh, in terms of professional development. Trading off some days and some things. So, uh, but you know, it is. There's no reason. I agree with Mr. Alcorn. There's no reason at all that we should. And there's not a disagreement in this room. That it's just a good idea. And and at the end of the day, I would say that part of our advocacy, Madam Advocacy, uh, is, <laughs> <laughs> is part of that message. Is that uh, those days are still there. I mean, those days are still there. They, there's some shift, but the days are still there. 
Uh, you know, if, if they go to a year-round calendar, the days are still there. If they go to modified, if they, if they align it with uh, community colleges, the days are still there. It just give the flexibility to the local uh, unit and, and with, uh, with standards and move well. on. Okay, Mr. Davis and then Superintendent Adams. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So two, two points on today. I assume we need public universities. Yes, sir. Okay. So, so do public universities and community colleges, they don't have the same 180 day requirement, right? Correct. So are we, is that what we're asking for? We want to be relieved from the 180 day requirement? Yeah. It's not, is it? No, no, no just to start. Correct. So we, we might want to reflect on the wording because that's, yeah. that's the way it landed on me. Okay, well, very good. good. And you know, it's, um, I'm glad that you said that because in our prior legislative asks, it had been an ask for flexibility on 180 days and the requirement on the hours. Uh, and this, this ask was viewed as more of a path of least resistance. Yeah. So believe me, if we, see the, uh, if we see the opportunity to have the complete flexibility, then there will be a wholesale level of support for that among public schools. Oh, absolutely. Mr. Chair, shouldn't we start there? I don't want to negotiate with ourselves here. Uh, Can you make that clear, Mr. Deputy what? Yeah, I think uh, it, uh, giving total flexibility, as she just said, total flexibility to the to the uh, local. I, I, I understand. It. We all understand it, what's what the situation is, but we got we might get closer to it than what we have here if we start there. And and I'm assuming that we're all in favor of local flexibility on uh, you know the standards on the there. 180 days. Of, what is it? Thousand. 25 hours or um, Mr. McDavid, I think I think we've consistently given that message to the yes, legislature. So I don't think we're backing off that. This is a short session item of something that we think is possible. Before I let Superintendent Atkinson speak, um, you know, I don't see a whole lot of resistance out there to calendar flexibility now. The problem is once something is in place, sometimes it's very hard to get it out of place. And I think, Mr. McDevitt, you <laughs> made a good point. Most of the people that led that effort are gone. And they're not even around anymore. But, uh, well, <laughs> not that all of them are gone at this point. <laughs> so, uh, yes, uh, Superintendent Atkins. Um, previously, <laughs> previously, Ms. Bo, you and I have met with the travel and tourism representatives. And during that conversation, when we were seeking to understand why we would still have such a law, the members with whom we talked uh, did agree that they thought it would be a good idea to give flexibility to low performing schools. So perhaps the step to get to total flexibility would be to start with a smaller set of schools. And so that's a part of the rationale to have that first step with schools uh, receiving uh, D's and F's to give them that flexibility. Uh, Mr. Lasser. I'd like to, to come in and say that if uh, D and F schools adopt a modified calendar and they become a B, C, or an A school, would they be allowed to continue with their modified calendar if that strategy is effective? So have it worked at, worked at a low performing school and moved it forward, I wouldn't want to go back and use old strategies if the strategy that I've used is proved to be effective. So I think that's something that's well said. Effective. And if, if in the language that would be drafted along these lines, we would want to be sure that whatever modification any school had been allowed okay. under this provision, they'd be able to maintain that okay. track record right. of success and all okay. the elements that go into it. Yes, uh, Mr. Day. We are actually in Charlotte trying this approach with four of our lowest performing schools and hoping that the results bear it out. I will admit that we've run into significant resistance from parents. That's why we only have four, as opposed to the 12 that we need to have. But we're following your logic. All right, very good. 
So the next item, number 11, early childhood education, a big passion of many folks at the table, I know. Uh, so these line items, one, to lift the unnecessarily double regulatory scheme off of public pre-K classrooms. So what we're talking about here is there are state regulations that are outside the public education setting, outside of the 115C state statutes that put a secondary layer of regulations on our public pre-K classrooms. So we would ask for those to be lifted and uh, increasing slots for those at-risk children who are out there and otherwise eligible and ensuring that the funding equates to the service levels needed for our children and then improving the continuum of early childhood education from a state level. So more of a governance perspective. And then finally, child nutrition and school nurses. The school nurses line item uh, and subject has been a great topic of interest not only among individual legislators, but also the Child Fatality Task Force is really looking to the state board's leadership on this ask for increasing funding for school nurses uh, to the tune of around $13 million when you combine the two smaller line items. And then child nutrition, uh, the Procurement Alliance is a great investment. We're saving LEAs $1 for every, uh, well, we're saving $6 for every $1 invested, and the investment on that is only $80,000. So that we hope would be an easy ask. And then further implementation of the child nutrition program standards, that is a bigger ask around 20 million because right now our school cafeterias, our school nutrition experts are unfortunately seeing a gap between what the federal government reimburses for versus what the costs are at the local level. And it's big and it's been increasing for a while, so that is a big ask. That concludes the draft I'm, legislative. I'm, 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 Mr. Bovier, the bill could be that we can. Uh, we've asked for this one dollar for every six dollars, eighty thousand. Why haven't they responded to this? This is not the first time, maybe the third time. We, I, I don't understand it. I, I do not know. It's a short answer. I think that because it is a smaller ticket item and it doesn't get wrapped into textbook funding or teacher assistant yeah. funding, or it's a it's a it's a relatively smaller, self-standing ticket item. However, uh, because of the bigger push in child nutrition, and we know that there are stakeholders newly interested in the bigger picture here, uh, then, then optimistically I'll say that may have a more likely chance of, um, of making it into the budget. Okay, I have another question. Um, you said that the reimbursement for lunches and breakfasts. I guess from the federal government, there's an increasing gap between that and what they're required to buy and serve. Is that is that part of the gap, or is that the whole gap? I, I, I mean, I you know I read the newspapers <laughs> and I hear that the federal government is requiring healthier food, which is great but it may be more expensive too. To, so can you comment on that? Yes, absolutely. And your suspicion is exactly correct. Uh, because of changes in the federal regulations and child nutrition standards that has further affected the costs and the differential loss at the local level. And I think Dr. Shotwell has something to add. Yeah, because, you know, we, we really try, even with full-pay students, to make sure that they get what's deemed a reimbursable meal. But even when they do, we're only getting six cents back from the federal government for those reimbursable meals. That's supposed to help offset the cost. The other piece of this is we're supposed to have our lunch prices at a certain uh, amount, or we're going to get penalized with commodities and some other issues there to have a, a basic minimum, and it varies across the board. Um, I mean. We're spending, uh, projected next year, almost $520,000 out of our local budget to maintain our child nutrition program. We haven't collected indirect costs from our child nutrition program since 2007. And the healthier the food, I, I granted the kids 
need it, I guess, but you know, we're not the full reason that they got a little overweight. You know, uh, you know, there's plenty of studies out there that show when they leave us and before the parents show up at 6 o'clock, there's a lot of eating going on. You know, and, um, and, if, and for us, the healthier the food, the more people it takes to get it prepared, because the way kids want it in presentation, if you give them a whole apple, they're not going to eat it. You cut it up for them, they're going to eat it. Same thing with, with strawberries and things. I mean, we're trying everything on our end to work those things out. But then again, when was the last time you had a really good whole wheat pizza? <laughs> I'll make sure I cook some next month. You know. We'll have that for lunch. You know, I mean, <laughs> some of them, yes, sir. But the kids that are truly hungry, they're going to eat it. Mr. Chair, I, I'd love to have us have a conversation, maybe at a future information session, that uh, that puts all of these issues, the costs. I mean, this morning we were told on some report that obesity has yes, yes gone up significantly. And and you're right, but it, it'd be nice to have kind of a, an understanding of all of that, the costs associated with it. What are the requirements? I had no idea that you might face a fine on commodities. Uh, I mean, I hadn't served, served Twinkies in over 11 years. And our French fries are not deep fried anymore, they're baked. Right. You know, so if they're trying to point the fingers back to the schools, you're going to be hard pressed to find that when you look at the, the calorie intake, the meals. And I tell you, I go out there and eat the meals because I loved them when I was a kid. <laughs> And stuff, I don't have a problem with them. I think, I think a lot of that food tastes good. It's the thought it's healthy for some of them, especially our older kids. And it's about presentation is part of it, too. I mean, it would be really nice for some of those cooks to go back to being able to cook again. Because in order for us to meet these requirements, a lot of the stuff is prepackaged food that we have to use. And when the kids see it getting poured out from a plastic bag, even though it's healthy and everything, it just does something to them. Tying all of these subjects together, Mr. Yeah. Chair, for me, is just because I, I do understand that it costs more to be healthy, to, yes. be, to, to eat healthy. There's a an activity or an exercise piece of, in, in all of this. I, I just think a comprehensive view, particularly if it's going to be on our, if we're going to be accountable, uh, and we're accountable for other things that we're not, that uh, we can't affect sometimes too. But I, I'd love to hear that. Short session, you're asking for what? This dollar again? So for the Child Nutrition Procurement Alliance, that's $80,000. And then for the School Child Nutrition Implementation, that is $20 million. And part of that, if not a large majority of it, goes to offset the very thing Dr. Shotwell is talking about. Schools are having to tap into their local general fund so monies otherwise yeah. dedicated to classrooms and students are having to go to pay the differentials. And it's, it's reached a breaking point that it's just no longer acceptable. And by no means is this a problem. I mean, Lynn is awesome. And she's been a wonderful help for us in, in trying to come up with different ideas. It's not really her. She's advocated the same way that I have, trying to get the folks to look at the USDA and say, can you back off on just some of these requirements? You know, we can still make it healthy, but try to back off of it just a little bit more. I, 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 would, I, I would want to know more. I understand that, Rodney. I do. I mean, I'm sure. uh, but my mom called me Rodney first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Miss. Uh, so I, I understand that, but I would. Uh, before we did that, I'd want to know the consequences, and then what would offset that, uh, because. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I just don't know. It's a question. It's not a comment as much as a question. I'd love for us to have a comprehensive understanding of this issue because right now, you're doing everything you can do, and our numbers are getting worse. I mean, that, isn't that what you reported this morning, Luke? Yesterday. 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 And so, something <coughs> disconnected here, and I think you've touched on some of it that's elsewhere, but I think that comprehensive. Then, before we were asking, USDA to back off. I'd like to know what it is we would say. Here's what you want to be happening instead, because the problem is still there. And 
And it's, you know, without getting into it here, it's more so in this nation than any other nation in the world. And there's got to be some reason. Okay, Ms. Welby, and then we're going to move on. Just a quick question, and this is, I'm not even asked about health. I know you're surprised. Um, this is, I'm just wondering, on number six, the North Carolina Virtual Public School, A, is there a dollar amount with that? Because I don't see a budget request. There, the ask from the virtual public school is for, I think, two or three positions, and uh, it's one of the school's own individual asks for course development and innovation, but it is not in the official budget request that went over to OSBM. Okay. It's what their individual need is, especially if they were to get the exemption uh, to do more course development, etc. That's a great question. Okay. okay, thank you. I, I think you've got the feedback you need. Yes. Okay. And to answer the question about number one salary in the Southeast, and this is a perfect segue into Catherine Truitt's uh, commentary about teacher salaries and the governor's mood, it's Georgia, and their salary, average salary, is number one in the Southeast currently at $53,382. Um, Mr. Al, uh, we talked about that at one point. Instead, instead of saying the southeast, say the contiguous uh, states, because I don't know if Georgia is important for us to compete with Georgia as much as it is for South Carolina, Tennessee, Virginia. Georgia is contiguous. Yep. Make it county. A little bit. Too much and we're talking we're talking about salary but really we should talk about total compensation uh, and I don't know if those kind of figures are available but you know it does make a difference what kind of benefits you're offering also Absolutely. total compensation I think we want to be number one in total compensation where I would say, but anyway. And that would include total compensation from the other states as well, so it's out. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right.